Okay, uh, we can start uh, on the solid count. Three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the November 12, 2024 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at the discretion and after consultation with their staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when discussing an item on the agenda. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Mr. Edwards or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Mr. Edwards, please call the roll to determine presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I will start with Ms. Booker Dwyer. Present. Ms. Frimpong. Present. Ms. Harvey. Present. Mr. Young. Mr. McMillian. Present. Or present. Thank you, we have a quorum. Mr. Edwards, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Manna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Here. Ms. Sample. Here. Ms. Jamison. Here. Ms. Smith. Present. Mr. Hartlove. Present. Ms. Amos. Present. Mr. Jones. Present. Ms. Lowe. Ms. Stahl. Present. Mr. Williams. Present. Mr. Smith. Present. Mr. Hodge. Present. Ms. Hamlet. Ms. Stansberry. Present. Ms. Ashenfelter. Present. Ms. Charlie Green. Mr. McCall. Present. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing none, thank you. I turn the meeting back to you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. So I am looking forward to today's meeting as we are going to uh, review the FY 2025 audits and receive an update on work plans. So I will turn it over to Ms. Barr to get us started. Thank you and good afternoon. In accordance with policy 8430 audit committee, the committee will review with the chief auditor and the external auditors the results of the annual audits and related comments, including any difficulties or disputes with management, any restrictions on the scope of audit work or access to required information, any significant changes in audit plans, the rationale behind adoptions and changes in accounting principles and accounting estimates requiring significant judgments. The committee will review the related findings and recommendations of the external auditors together with management's response. The committee will review all internal audit reports, which include related issues and recommendations of internal audit together with management's responses. Additionally, in accordance with policy 8400 Office of Internal Audit, Internal audit shall evaluate risk, risk exposure related to the achievement of the organization's strategic objectives. The chief auditor will monitor and adjust the plan as needed in response to changes in BCPS business, risks, operations, programs, systems, and controls. Deviations from the approved work plan will be communicated to the audit committee and executive leadership through periodic activity reports. Internal audit may conduct unplanned audits as necessary in response to changes in BCPS business, risks, operations, programs, systems, and controls. Therefore, if this is, 
at this afternoon's meeting, committee members will receive the results of Clifton Larson Allen's annual comprehensive financial report and the Office of Internal Audit reports related to FY25 completed audits and work plan updates. I now turn it back over to you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Amos, please proceed with the fiscal year 2024 annual comprehensive financial report. Thank you very much and thank you to the committee for having me here today to uh, present the audit results for the fiscal year 2024 annual comprehensive financial report or the act for as we call it. Um, before I, I go into the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of the presentation, I just want to uh, express gratitude to everybody throughout the school system that uh, we worked with over the past probably six to nine months, um, off and on through this audit um, process. Uh, we not only uh, work with a lot of individuals in fiscal services, but um, different folks throughout the school system, for example, your IT department. Um, and so we're really appreciative of all the time, um, all the um, information they provided, uh, responses to our inquiries, um, and making sure that um, we had another successful audit year. So um, thank you to everybody that, that helped make this happen. We appreciate it. Um, for the fiscal year 2024, um, we issued CLA an unmodified audit opinion. This is uh, what we consider a clean audit opinion or a good opinion. It's the highest level of assurance that um, we as CLA can provide uh, BCPS that the financial information is free of material misstatement. Um, I do use the word material in, in that comment just because we do have a materiality um, and that's used throughout. We don't audit every dollar of the financial information um, that's presented. Uh, the financial statements are the responsibility of management. Um, they are responsible for um, selecting the accounting principles um, that go into the financials and putting all the information together in the complete package, uh, making sure it's in accordance with standards, um, um, both um, just in addition to normal standards, but the government accounting standards as well. Um, and then our role um, in the audit is to issue that three or four page audit opinion at the beginning of the financials. Um, that That's the only product that CLA, so to speak, um, provides for the ACFR. Um, as previously was communicated to the board, um, the school system is required by state law to have their financial report um, submitted to MSDE by September 30th. However, due to some turnover in the accounting department this year, um, that report was not issued until October 18th this year. So about three weeks delayed in getting that um, report out the door um, for the year. Uh, this year, there was one accounting standard, GASB Statement 100, um, accounting changes and error corrections that was applicable for the school system. However, there was no impact to the financial statement as a result of this statement um, due to the fact that their management did not change any accounting policies during the year um, and there were no error corrections from prior years that needed to be recorded in the current year. Um, so at the end of the day, um, that, that standard ended up not really being applicable for this year. So um, from our standpoint, I think probably um, accounting could agree. It was a pretty quiet year from a standard standpoint. Um, past couple of years, we've seen multiple standards in a year um, have to be implemented. So it was um, a nice refresher not to have to worry about too much of that this year. Uh, as previously communicated to you all, there are two significant accounting estimates in your financials. Um, accounting estimates are um, just that they're estimates, so the future um, could be um, different depending on how um, different inputs um, today end up panning out in the future. Um, those two estimates are related to your other post-employment benefits liability and your incurred but not reported um, self-insurance claims. Both of those estimates have uh, inputs that are determined by management, such as discount rates, mortality rates, things of that nature. Uh, and both those estimates are um, performed um, with an actuary. The board does hire actuaries to complete those estimates with management input on, um, on some of the assumptions that are being made. 
we reviewed both of those estimates. Um, we looked at the inputs, the underlying data that was submitted to the actuaries and tested the underlying data to make sure it was reasonable. Um, any of the inputs and assumptions that were used in those calculations, uh, we made sure that they are reasonable compared to either accounting standards where there is guidance and also industry um, standards as well and did not have any um, problems or any um, uh, didn't determine that they were unreasonable in any way, shape or form. Uh, this year we did have um, several uncorrected and corrected misstatements in the financial statements. Um, I'll start with the uncorrected misstatements. There was um, a liability associated with litigation of approximately $550,000 that was not recorded in the financial statements. Um, when it comes to uncorrected misstatements, we consider that to be um, more than trivial, but not material that the um, that required that adjustment to be run through the financials. Um, but because it was more than a trivial amount, um, we are required under standards to report that to you all as part of your governance oversight. We also had a series of corrected misstatements in the financials. So these were um, areas where um, us as auditors noted that adjustment needed to be made. It was material in nature um, and, and management did um, make those adjustments um, in the financial statements. Uh, the first one was related to a $3.2 million accounts receivable associated with non-public placement that was understated um, in the financial. So an adjusting entry was recorded to properly increase the amount owed by the state of Maryland as of year end. The second one was a $5.5 million adjusting entry associated with compensated absences. Um, compensated absences is related to um, leave that is earned by employees at June 30th, but not yet taken. Um, the underlying support provided by management did not agree to the financials. Um, and so that's um, why the $5.5 million adjustment was recorded to correct the liability at year end. Uh, the system is currently going through a major undertaking of implementing Oracle as their um, system of record, um, but still in what we consider from an accounting standpoint, the beginning stages of the system implementation. Uh, management had recorded a $7.2 million right to use asset on the books um, in accordance with um, GASB statement number 96. Um, however, since um, that implementation is still in the Again, from a accounting standpoint, we consider the initial phase and that management has not been able to fully utilize or put into service any of the modules related to that system. Uh, we had to um, remove that right to use asset and associate liability of $7.2 million off the books this year. Um, and then the, the um, offsetter, so to speak, the second piece to that was a $4.9 million prepaid asset that had to be recorded in accordance with the standard. Um, capital assets related to bulk purchases were not recorded this year um, for about $5.2 million. So adjusting entry was made to properly capitalize those items. And then lastly, um, you have a liability associated with finance purchases. These would be purchases for buses, vehicles, things of that nature. Um, there was a principal payment for about $1.6 million um, that was not recorded to reduce the liability in the current year. So an adjusting entry was made for that as well. Um, with all of that combined, um, given the number of adjusting entries that we had in the current year, uh, we did have a significant deficiency in internal controls associated with adjusting journal entries. Um, and the details of that are, are really basically what I just went through. Um, obviously, the adjusting journal entries were related to the turnover in the accounting department and the timing of certain folks joining the department um, and trying to get caught up to speed and make sure everything was properly recorded for the year. Um, we did not have any material weaknesses in internal controls, just the one significant deficiency. Um, and lastly, um, there was one management letter comment this year. Uh, management letter comments we consider to be best practices. They don't rise to the level of a significant deficiency or material weakness, but we do think it's important to, um, to make note of it. Um, and this one was related to the annual financial disclosure forms 
um, that are um, completed by certain individuals throughout the school system each year. Those forms are required to be submitted to the Office of Law by April 30th. Um, and we tested or reviewed five of those disclosures and two out of the five uh, were not submitted to the Office of Law by that April 30th deadline. So I um, wanna make sure that those are submitted timely going forward to make sure management has all the information necessary to make sure they're making sound um, decisions for, for the Board of Education. Um, and with that, um, that's pretty much the crux of our presentation today and would gladly entertain any questions that you all might have. Thank you, Ms. Amos. Committee members, are there any questions? Ms. Booker Dreyer, I have one. Yes, go ahead, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Sherry, the, if I'm not mistaken, the first prior to the adjusted journal entries, you mentioned, I, I thought the, the number was $750,000 where you said it wasn't trivial. It was, was five, the, oh, I'm sorry, it's 540,000. $540,000. Mm -hmm. So just what were the terms that you used for that? It wasn't such and such, but it was something else. So there is, um, we do have a materiality that we use for the financial, you know, for what it, when it comes to classifying these adjusting entries. Um, so there's different levels of materiality. So but we have um, the, the low thresholds, what we consider a clearly trivial threshold. So if it's over that amount, which this was, but doesn't meet the criteria of being material, it's that in between, I would say, is where we don't have to record it in the financial statements, but we do need to bring it to the board's attention as part of your governance oversight. And could you identify that four hundred or that five hundred and forty thousand dollars? I mean, yeah, yes, it was related to a litigation liability that was not recorded. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm, sure. Thank you. Any other questions for from committee members? Okay. Oh, wait, I see a hand raised. Oh, Mr. Hartlove. Yes, and I don't I don't I don't want to jump in front of any board members, so I just but I did want to say something when you get to the closing this item out. No, yes, you can proceed, Mr. Hartlove. It doesn't appear that board members have any additional questions. Sure. I I just want wanted to um uh thank all of the fiscal services staff. Uh, you know, the, the audit results are a product of what we do all year long. Uh, you know, we're constantly, you know, recording transactions throughout the year, and those transactions need to be recorded properly. There's a very large number of transactions that are being recorded. So our staff, I think they do a, a very, very good job uh, all year long. And it you know the the results are the the clean audit and and we're really proud of that um i'm in particular i wanted to thank a few uh employees who really went the extra mile this year um uh, mr jones ms ashenfelter uh, ms howard and ms harris um all four um we had as as um uh, Ms. King uh, referred to, we did have some turnover and it was kind of midstream, which was uh, made things difficult for us. But these these folks um, really went the extra mile in the month of September. There was a lot of uh, candle burning at, at both ends with these folks. They were working long hours, weekends um, in order to get things done and 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 done in, a, in an, a, an accurate fashion. So I really wanted to thank them and uh, you know, um, really appreciate them going the extra mile. So that's all I all, all I wanted to say, and thank you for allowing me the time to say it. Thank you, and I echo your words exactly because I know how um, intense a financial audit is and how much time it takes, and um, definitely appreciate it and all the work of the team. So thank you all. Okay, so we will move to the next report on Kelly Services Payments Audit Report. So I will turn that over to Mr. Street. 
Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Uh, good evening, board members, staff, and guests. Um, my name is Alex Strait, and uh, I'm going to present the Office of Temporary and Support Services Kelly Education Payment Audit. I first wanted to thank Ms. Lowe, who was our direct liaison during the entire project, Ms. Stahl, Ms. Stansberry, and the rest of the staff in the Temporary and Support Services Office um, that helped along with the audit. Uh, this report is posted on the Office of Internal Audit's website and on board docs. Next slide, please. BCPS uh, partners with Kelly Education to provide substitute staffing. Kelly Education is now the uh, employer of record for substitutes. And as a complete education staffing solution, Kelly Education manages the recruiting, screening, scheduling, training, and orientation of qualified substitute teachers and non-instructional staff. The objective of our audit was to assess the accuracy, completeness, and legitimacy of the payments to L Kelly Education for substitute teachers and nurse management services. Next slide, please. During our audit, we, uh, we noted four commendations in our audit report. They include training, and this, uh, this recognized that uh, office staff provided uh, what, what they call SFE operator training sessions throughout uh, the year via Microsoft Teams. And this training is most specifically for the, uh, the operators of the time and attendance software at the schools, uh, but it is available to any employee within the school system. So uh, we gave uh, the staff kudos for that. Um, that's, a, that's a good process to have. We also uh, provided a combination on SOPs. They're, um, they have documented processes and they're finalizing those in the formal SOP format, but the processes are all documented and are, and are what we used as our baseline for testing. Another combination is vacancy analysis. Um, temporary and support services has access to vacancy reports throughout the year and performs spot checks on that data. And this year, the manager of staffing performs a comparison of those vacancies versus the reported vacancies in the time and attendance uh, software. And it, it looks like the goal in the future is going to be to collaborate more with the Department of Staffing and uh, try to gauge some um, data analysis related to substitute usage versus full time hiring and see if that can be molded into a more formal process where uh, where staffing can be aided with the data that is collected from substitute information. And fourth, uh, communication. Um, the supervisor of temporary services was very prompt with uh, our audit requests and provided detailed explanations throughout the process. Um, there was never a lag in my communications with her, and um, it was a very easy process on my end, and I hope on her end as well. Um, next slide, please. Our audit uh, reported uh, no findings related to the payments made to Kelly Education Services. Uh, however, we wanted to highlight that um, there is a potential risk with this entire process, and we wanted to um, just uh, ex explain it a little bit. Uh, Kelly Education and, and Temporary uh, and support services rely on the accurate attendance and payroll data from schools, but they do not directly oversee or approve those time verifications related to the substitute program. So uh, although temporary services uh, owns the process of substitutes uh, with their uh, third party vendor, Kelly Education, um, they do provide training for those processes and best practices to the school staff. But the decentralized nature of time and attendance and payroll um, for substitute attendance is a risk. Um, our testing did not find any issues, but it, it is a, overall the decentralized uh, nature of the entire process is a risk. And we wanted to just make that known to everyone. Um, and that concludes my uh, presentation for the report. I open it up to any questions or any uh, comments from staff. Thank you, Mr. Strait. Uh, committee members, do you have any questions?
I do have one question. Are there any school systems um, that have centralized uh, the process? Uh, I would, I would uh, open up that question to any staff from temporary services. I, I would assume that Kelly Education has other school systems that they uh, work with, but um, that would be a, I know we just recently, they control all hiring for substitutes. We no longer hire them, but I would open it up to staff for that specific question. Wait, the risk that you presented, is that a risk for our school system or yes. a risk for Kelly? Sir? So, okay. Yes. Yeah, well, Kelly Services is not so. Uh, the whole pro it's a risk for the whole process. So, so Kelly Services has direct access to the time and attendance system, and that's how they populate their invoices weekly for uh, the Office of Temporary and Support Services. Um, but that information that they pull from the system is is incumbent on the staff at the school providing accurate and uh, time in attendance. And I see Laura has her hand up, but yes. Hi, thank you, yes, Alex. Yes, I, yes. I just want to make sure I understand so I can answer. Um, so yes, so Kelly Education has access to the Smart Find Express system on the substitute side of it. Um, they can view some information for our teachers so that we can make sure that our absences are aligned, but they can't change or manipulate that data. So when Alex is referring to the incumbency of the schools to make sure that is correct, um, that means that the schools control um, and the teachers to some point, the data and, and absence requests that they're putting into the system that then enable us to assign substitutes and on the back end get them paid out. Um, I, I hope that answered the question that you were asking. If not, please feel free to restate it and I can make sure I answer it more fully if I didn't. <laughs> no, I, I believe you You answered it. No, that is helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Street. For our next report, we will um, have we will review the school activity fund accounting audit, and for that, I turn it over to Ms. Jamison. Thank you. Good evening, board members, staff, and guests. Today, I'm going to present the results on the school activity fund or SAF accounting audit. This report is posted on our website and on board docs. I'd like to thank Mr. Williams and Mr. Jones for being here with us today for this presentation. Next slide, please. School activity funds are funds that are generated by school sponsored activities, things like field trips, fundraisers, those kind of activities that are managed by school staff and maintained in a school bank account. The Office of SAF Accounting is responsible for providing guidance and training related to the proper management of these funds. So our objective for this audit was to assess the central office SAF processes, such as training offered, maintenance of the accounting manual for school activity funds, and monitoring and review of monthly SAF financial reports. Next slide, please. Our audit identified three commendations. First of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Williams, who's the fiscal supervisor too, who was very prompt in responding to any requests that I had and provided follow-up information whenever I needed it. The second commendation is related to training. The SAF accounting staff offers a wide variety of training related to SAF, such as new fiscal personnel training and orientation, new principal induction training, office professional induction training, athletic director training, and year-end training for those processes specific to that one time of the year. The last commendation we have is related to monitoring of reports. The SAF accounting staff monitors each school's financial reports on a monthly basis. They collect numerous data points related to account balances and financial transactions, and if necessary, they get into contact with school personnel to resolve any issues or follow up to get more information. Next slide, please. So in our audit, we had three findings. The first one relates to standard operating procedures or SOPs. What we found was that the existing SOPs did not include procedures for the maintenance of the accounting manual for school activity funds or training in the proper management of school activity funds. 
Additionally, there is no SOP regarding third-party ticketing vendors, such as Ticket Spicket or GoFan, which are now used a lot by schools to collect money for events like sports games or theater productions. Our recommendation is that the Office of SAF Accounting create and implement new SOPs to address these areas and, um, and also the third-party ticketing vendors. I'm going to turn it over now to Mr. Williams to discuss management's corrective action. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, good afternoon, board members and staff. And I just want to give a shout out to Andrea and her staff for kind of working with us. <clears throat> We're a small group and we have a lot on our plate, so we try to accommodate everyone as best we could. But the process was pretty smooth, uh, thanks to Andrea and her um, and Ms. Barr and her team. Um, so thanks again. Uh, so one of the things that we'll do as a result of uh, the audit is to uh, create, and we've actually started the process of creating and implementing the SOPs, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Andrea, including the accounting manual, the training, and the whole process of third party ticketing. Okay, Mr. Williams, all done? Yes, for this. Okay, section. next slide, please. So our second finding is related to the accounting manual for school activity funds, which guides the schools and office personnel in how to properly manage the funds. We found that it was last updated in 2013 and had outdated information in it relating to old accounting systems and old outdated practices. We also noted that Superintendent's Rule 3125, which covers SAF, was last revised in May of 2018 and may also need to be revised. So our recommendation in this area is that the Office of SAF Accounting update the Accounting Manual for School Activity Funds to reflect current practices. And we also recommend that they take a look at 3125 to see if any revisions are necessary. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Williams to discuss management's corrective actions. Yes, and again, thank you, Andrew. And we will indeed follow uh, the directive of the Office of Internal Audit. Um, our staff will, uh, we've started a process and we have we have weekly ses work sessions. We're going to go through, I think it's probably about 80 pages in length. So we've, we've broken that up and we started a process and we will work closely with Internal Audit to ensure that when the final product is done, we'll um, have something ready. So we've started that process uh, in terms of updating and reviewing the accounting manual and indeed uh, to review rule 3125 to ensure that um, it is in line, we're in line with uh, what the rule allows us to do. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Next slide, please. So the third and final uh, finding related to uh, training, and that was that the Office of SAF Accounting during our audit period did not maintain its own records of new school-based fiscal personnel training for the audit period. And as a result of undergoing this audit, we asked them to compile a list of training interactions, which they did for us, which included site visits, team calls, uh, phone calls, any kind of support they provided for these newly hired fiscal personnel. We determined that one of the 20 school-based fiscal personnel hired within our audit period did not receive the proper training. So we're recommending that the Office of SAF Accounting monitor and maintain training records to ensure that all newly hired fiscal personnel receive the proper training. I'll now turn it back over to Mr. Williams for management's corrective action. Thank you again, Andrea. So uh, we have uh, on the direction from internal audit uh, created a very robust uh, database, uh, primarily using the Excel platform as our basis. And one of the failings that we had, uh, our records were totally reliant upon the data we got from the school of the platform, which underwent massive um, updates and in so doing, it kind of lost some of the data. Um, so in addition to the school of the platform data, we're also going to uh, we have created and will update frequently our own uh, in-house uh, process or database to ensure that uh, everyone that all our new hires are followed through and we can account for all the training that um, is required. And that, as Andrew mentioned, 
is a plethora of uh, methods that we use from the Schoology platform, in-person, Microsoft Teams, and as we need to, extended phone calls. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Next slide, please. This concludes our presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McMillian, I see you've uh, come on. Do you have a question? Yes, please. Yes, go ahead. Ms. Jamison, in the three results, has there been a, a timeline established for Mr. Williams and his team to complete these? Yes, for every audit, we ask for an anticipated completion date. And for the SOPs, which was the first finding, that date was never, is actually coming up. It's November 15th, 2024. The second one, which is the accounting manual for school activity funds update and review of 3125, is going to take longer. So the anticipated completion date is April 30th, 2025. And then the last one regarding training is also com anticipated completion of November 15th, 2024. Okay, great. And and in that uh, timeline, do you have built in a time when you and your group goes back to examine whether the corrective yes. action has been done? we keep track of every single corrective action and every single anticipated completion date, and we follow up as close to po as possible to determine if the matter has been closed out. Okay. So Thank Mr. You very Williams much. will be hearing from me in, in not too far from now <laughs> for two of these issues. Thank Absolutely. you. You're welcome. Committee members, are there any other questions? Ms. Frimpong. Good afternoon. So we see in the um, audits, we see different types of documentation, but Typically, we see the SOPs um, or just maybe like a manual or best practices. So I just wanted to comment that I appreciated that um, the documentation this time also extended to the rule um, so that it's not just a matter of, um, I guess, improving best practices, but also capturing that information um, at the school system level with a rule. Um, is that something typically? Um, done as far as documentation or do we normally limit it to um, just the standard operating procedures and, and manuals etc so for most audits that we complete we we do look at associated policies and rules we don't always recommend for um, review or, or update it just happened to be relevant for this particular audit but for every audit that i have worked on i always take a look at the associated policy and rule thank you Thank you, Ms. Frimpong. Any other questions? So, Ms. Jamison, when was the last time um, SAF was audited? Well, uh, as far as the, from a central perspective, like this audit, we have never done that before. But we do perform SAF audits um, as requested at individual school sites. And I believe Ms. Barr might want to chime in about that being included in our work plan at some point. Yes, thank you. Um, so we do, as Ms. Jamison mentioned, uh, upon request, we do the uh, three-year cash analysis annually so that we're on top of looking at the cash balances um, at all schools, we do it for 100% of the schools. So this year we're we're looking to incorporate a little bit more of a review, and we're actually working um, collaboratively with Mr. Williams um, and Mr. Jones to determine the best approach and where our uh, resources should be focused and targeted for this uh, coming for this school year. Okay, and then so with this audit finding of around the training, um, are there a, effective practices that you all look at regarding the frequency of training or the um, the like refresher training? Yes, so we had conversations with Mr. Williams and Mr. Jones about the training process, and currently, uh, and Mr. Williams, please jump in if I say this wrong. Um, the only required training is the new fiscal personnel training. 
Um, they, as I mentioned, they offer a, a wide variety of training, but uh, it's not, not all of it is mandatory, but it is out there. And we wanted to highlight the fact that they do provide it. Like for athletic directors, you wouldn't think that such training might be out there, but it is because they do a lot of money handling. Yes, and just to kind of piggyback off what Andrew said, we, uh, I think our primary focus is to accommodate all new hires, which, you know, the intent is obvious. And we, from time to time, will have refresher trainings and uh, training as we see fit. Because one of the things that we do as a small team is to visit the schools to kind of get a sense as to, you know, who needs help, when and how. And they will kind of customize the training to accommodate uh, the situation as it warrants. So uh, we try to do as much training as we can, give it, given the limited resources that we have available. Um, but uh, the schools kind of know who we are, and we've, you know, this week we've had, you know, two requests to stop out to the schools to do some training because one, uh, a fiscal retired abruptly, and another just got ill. So we're going to have to step in and we'll go out and do some training and take a look and make sure everything is in order. And just to uh, piggyback again off what Ms. Barr said, we're kind of the face of fiscal services so we can see firsthand what it is. And as we see fit, we'll reach out to internal audit to say you might want to take a look here and here to see what exists. But we're kind of the first um, first ones on the ground to kind of see how things work. So, But the short answer is we provide as much training as time and resources will allow us to do. And then with the training, is, so is there any um, feedback or quality control measures or um, ways that it's being to ensure that what has been trained on is actually being implemented as intended? I guess the, the, the end, uh, short answer is yes. So we'll, we'll know when, you know, as each new fiscal goes downstream, we'll kind of get a sense of have they grasp the principles and are able to uh, apply them practically. But as we do the trainings, especially those that are currently on the school to platform, we have a batch of assessment tests and based on those results, we kind of decide who may need more support than others. And we try to get as much feedback as we can. And we focus primarily on the new, the new folks. And then we have others that may need help that are, have been here for a little while. But we try to, um, to get as much feedback as we can in terms of, you know, is the training beneficial? And if not, what can we do to accommodate the shortcomings? I, I okay, thank you. I appreciate that because I'm just wondering with the the audit findings, right? When I look at um, the effect, for instance, of an outdated manual, um, and you list that it could be errors, training gaps, lack of awareness, I I just still get back to that um, the criteria that's being used for the audit because we know it's an effective practice to, um, to engage in that refresher training. We know that there's certain effective practices. So I can see kind of these effects being, um, these effects could still occur. Um, and so I, that's why I just keep getting back to, I get it that we are, that the audit is occurring against the, against the manual, it's not looking at the quality of it, it's occurring, did they do the one training, not looking at the quality of it, not looking at is it a following effective um, professional learning practices. And so I, I feel like if we're not looking at those pieces, then it could still potentially be a risk for um, Baltimore County schools. Probably, but I'll just add that in addition to that initial training that all new hires get, one of the things my team does is to basically stay with these new folks for at least one fiscal year. And stay with them uh, typically means uh, school visits, uh, hopefully, you know, at, at a minimum once a month or team session once a week or phone calls. And we so we have, I think we have currently maybe I want to say 18 new hires since July 1st. So we kind of break them up into each uh, 
accountant has a batch of uh, new fiscals to work with, and we hold their hands basically for at least a year. Some may need a little bit more time, others not, depending on you know their rate of growth and so on and so forth. So uh, yes, uh, the uh, manual has some soft spots, and we're working on that, but as a supplement, we pretty much make sure we hold the hands of all new persons to ensure that they at least um, can do what they need to do um, until they can stand on their own. And I'll just add that I think that the the finding about the manual is one of the most critical because if they don't have updated information on which to um, base their operations, then um, it, you know, if we went out to audit them and the school activity funds using the old manual, we would have a lot of problems because the procedures that are mentioned in the manual are not current procedures. So we feel that by providing this recommendation for the Office of SAF Accounting to get the manual updated, it will help us in our further efforts with um, SAF audits in the future. Absolutely. Yes. Additionally, I wanted to add that um, they, that the SAF Accounting Office really does have a very uh, thorough and robust monitoring process in place and uh, documents the results of their monitoring and review uh, on a monthly basis. I think that was mentioned earlier, but I just wanted to make sure that committee members were aware that they really do have a, a very good monitoring process in place. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we will move on to the employee hearing appeals process audit report. And for that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Sample. Thank you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Good afternoon, committee members and staff and others attending this meeting. I am Sandra Sample, one of the senior auditors in the Office of Internal Audit. I would like to thank Mr. Charles Smith, the manager of the Office of Employee and Student Hearings for being here to address uh, management's corrective action and to possibly to answer any possible questions. We completed the employee appeals audit and issued the final report on November 1st, 2024. The report can be found on board docs for this meeting and it is posted to internal audits website. Next slide, please. The Office of Employee and Student Hearings make determinations on various employee matters and decides a variety of student, student appeals. And an example of a employee matter might be a grievance or a recommendation recommendation for termination. The objective of the audit is to determine if the processes related to employee appeals are timely, consistent, and comply with applicable regulations. This audit focused only on the employee appeals process. And our audit period was July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2024. Next slide, please. So we identified four commendations for this audit. The first commendation relates to communication. We worked with Mr. Charles Smith. Um, from the very beginning, Mr. Smith was more than cooperative and provided prompt and detailed responses to our inquiries. Also, Ms. Constance, Ham Ms. Constance Hamlet, who is the administrative assistant, was prompt in providing requested information. The second commendation is related to documentation. Um, we wanted to commend the Office of Employee and Student Hearings for maintaining documentation on appeal cases. Information was readily available and organized, and it was complete. We did not have to ask for, we didn't have to ask where missing information was because everything was there. The third commendation is related to regulatory requirements. For each employee appeal decision we reviewed, applicable regulatory requirements were considered. We wanted to ensure that decisions considered um, that decisions considered any applicable re requirements and that 
decisions weren't random or arbitrary. The last commendation is regarding consistency. We wanted to determine if similar regula regulatory requirements were applied to similar decisions that were appealed. We know that regulatory requirements are applied on a case-by-case -case basis and applicable regulations depend on the details of the appeal. But when applicable, there, there was consistency for similar cases. Next slide, please. We identified one result related to <clears throat> issuing grievance appeal decision letters beyond the time frame outlined in the bargaining unit agreements. Bargaining unit agreements outline a 10-day or a 15-day time frame for issuing grievance appeal decision letters after the hearing date. And for four of the six grievance appeal cases we reviewed, appeal decisions should have been issued within 10 days. However, they were issued 11 to 16 workdays after the hearing date. Now, we understand that verbal approval was received for the extension of the decision delays, but they were not documented. And our concern was that not documenting the approval to delay an appeal decision could have a negative impact if, if there's a dispute. And... Here, we recommend that approvals to delay decisions should be documented and incorporated into the SOPs. Next slide, please. I will turn it over to Mr. Smith for management's corrective action. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, uh, Mr. Smith. I'm, I go by the name of Chuck. Uh, we agreed with the audit result about the corrective action um, as, um, Sandy said, we, we have reached oral agreements with the various uh, members of the um, representative team for employees, but uh, the, the uh, idea of having those documented um, is, is something that, that we agree with and that we will implement. Uh, we will start implementing the um, documentation on or before December 1st, and uh, we will incorporate that documentation requirement in our SOPs uh, no later than June 30, 2025. And that covers it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Next slide, please. Well, I'd like to thank you again, Mr. Smith, and also Ms. Hamlet for their cooperation during this audit. Ms. Booker Dwyer. I will turn it back over to you for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Sample. Uh, committee members, any questions? Ms. Harvey. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for uh, this report and the information that is uh, therein. In my efforts to continue to understand uh, and increase my knowledge of the uh, audit unit and, and what we do and how it serves the board and BCPS and the community at large. I just have a few uh, process questions. This um, audit was conducted in what time frame? Our audit period was July 1st, 2023 to June 30, 2024. So the 2024 fiscal year. So you um you use the entire year to complete the audit i guess that's what i'm asking oh that time period represents the dates that appeals um uh, appeals occurred so it didn't take us that long to right. complete the audit I, yeah oh, okay. <laughs> i didn't think so that's my so my question was really how long did you work on on this particular audit if I recall correctly, we started the audit um, in September of this year. We, uh, we began the planning in September and mm -hmm. issued the final report on November 1st. Great. Um, about Great. Months, Thank yeah. you. And can you tell me, 
So the audit period was July to June 2024, and I did see a notation in the report that provided um, the clarity that the um, the grievances, I believe, were the data was recorded on the calendar year. So did you use the calendar year data or did you use July 1, 23 to June 2024 data? Yeah, that's correct. Um, it, we do reference the calendar year um, for some um, points of information, but for the cases that we reviewed, we reviewed ap appeal cases from July 1st, 2023 through June 30, 2024. So that's the fiscal year. Great, great, great. Uh, and, and then um, my next question is, how do you determine sample size? So for so for that um, period of July through June 30, 2024, um, there was a total of 113 appeal cases, and our sample size is determined based on our uh, the guidelines that we use in our office for our audits. And um, if I'm sorry, if one of Andrea Barr can come online and explain the process we use for our sample guidance. Sure. So we do mm -hmm. use sampling guidance that was uh, recommended and provided to us by the uh, external audit group. Sometimes uh, it, it's based on um, the type of risk associated with the project. Sometimes a sample can be selected judgmentally. Um, sometimes it can be selected haphazardly. Sometimes it could be 100%. It just depends on whether or not the um, the audit has been determined to be high, medium, or low risk, and um, the the size of the population. So Ms. Sample mentioned 113 or 130. So it, it probably would be a uh, lower percentage just based on the total population size itself as well. So for this audit, the sample size was a percentage of, of cases? I would have to ask Correct. the sample. And I can tell you that our sample size totaled 30 appeal cases. So we reviewed 30 of the 113 total. Okay. Was that was that data in the report that you reviewed 30 of 113? I didn't, I could have missed it, but I don't think I saw it. No, it's not in the report. Okay, that that's fine. I just wanted to make sure I didn't misread. And then I think my last question is, is you reference the um, the uh, related uh, policies or statutes or regulations, and uh, it, it you reference. Um, the education article six, is it the entirety of the article or is it a specific subsection from the annotated code of Maryland education article title six that's related to this specific audit? That's a good question. And I apologize for not being able to tell you specifically which part of title six um, that was used or that was applicable to employee appeals. Um, that is, we'll have to get that answered and get back to you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for the work and I appreciate the presentation. Thank you. And so could the audit report be modified to include that information that Ms. Harvey is requesting so that the full picture is, um, shared because there's some, you know, Ms. Harvey brought up some pretty good points about some key pieces that appear to be missing. And I know that these reports are public and it would be important that the public has the full picture of what, of, of all the data in the process that went into this. Um, are you, um thinking of including information such as the sample size and the specific Title VI um, annotated code 
that we yes. use? Oh, okay. Um, so I, I, I believe we could issue um, an amended report, but once again, I'll ask Miss um, Barr to come on and speak about that. Yeah. It, it's not um, always typical to put that information in, that the information that you're discussing is applicable and documented in the work papers. If you look at the report, our, our scope and methodology is indicated in the report towards the end um, of the report. So uh, I would not I, be. Uh, I see the scope and I, I see that. I don't mm -hmm. see the sample size. And that's not that's not But that's effective not, data. So I'm just thinking about just effectively reporting data. You always include the sample size. I don't know of any reputable publication where they're presenting some type of data where the sample size is not included. Yeah, I don't I don't have the report open in front of me. I'm not sure what was included in in that report. But our sample sizes are thoroughly documented in our work papers. If that is a process that you would like to see going forward and documented in the reports, we'll we'll take that under advisement. I mean, when you when you look at the uh, financial uh, document that just was presented by the external auditors, they don't include their sample sizes in their reports either. So we're just following um, industry standards. But if that's something that this this committee and or the board would like to see uh, moving forward in our reports, we can certainly take that under advisement. Ms. Harvey. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So I think it becomes important because you, in this particular report, you you pointed to that in four of the six grievance cases that you reviewed, there was a lack of compliance with the 10 day mandate. So at, from a public perspective, if I'm reading this report, I'm asking myself, did they just look at six cases out of what appeared to be 125 when you look at the graphs? for 2023 because there's no 2024 data on the graph although the audit period is from uh, is fiscal is fiscal year so July to June uh, so it it there's a missing piece there that that doesn't give the public uh, the context for the veracity of the audit because uh, you know, 30 of 113 is a far cry different than four of six. Uh, and so I, I do think it's important that the public understand that you all are doing, um, you know, a, a rigorous, you know, valid sample size for, for your audits, however you determine sample size. And it sounds like you have a, a varied, um, varied um, determination for sample size. So uh, it, it, it's something to consider because uh, reading this report, then that's why I asked because the only data in there about your sample size was four of six for the grievances. And that seemed small to me for an audit of, you know, over a hundred instances and to make a finding based on that. but that was an inaccurate picture because you actually reviewed 30 cases. So I think it's important that that context be included so that the public can see the level of work that's being done and that's going into the decision making. Yes, thank you for thank you for your input. And and this just I, I feel like gets back to my earlier point where as a board, we need to decide specifically what we want to see in these reports to inform our governance decisions um, so that it is so that we're ensuring that what's being shared with the public is is accurate and it's painting the whole picture so that there is nothing left to question. Um, I get that, you know, there's there's industry standards and industry standards are the they, they're the minimum. 
Um, and in Baltimore County Public Schools, we are looking to elevate and to, to, to be excellent in all that we do. And so I think this gets back to the original point that I had um, a few meetings ago, where as a board, we truly need to get together and, and get on one accord about what it is we expect from these reports so that we, so it can inform our governance decision and it can um, tell the accurate story to the public. Any other questions or comments from committee members? Okay, thank you, Ms. Sample. The next um, item is new business, and I will turn that over to Ms. Barr, who will um, provide an update of the FY26 work plan. Uh, thank you. I just uh, wanted to provide the committee with a brief update that our office is continuing to, to complete the FY26 risk assessment process. And as part of the completion of the uh, FY26 work plan. So uh, we're on target. Surveys were uh, developed for the um, cabinet and finalized. Research is ongoing and seven surrounding LEA internal audit shops were contacted to determine how they collect risk assessment information. Uh, five of the seven responded. Three of the five do use surveys. One conducts interviews and one um, LEA is in the process of shifting to more risk-based auditing over school activity fund audits. So they will be reaching out um, to me for further information about how we conduct our risk assessment. And I'll now turn it over to Mr. Fletcher so he can discuss the status and next steps related to the risk assessment process for FY26. Thank you, Ms. Barr. And as part of our FY26 risk assessment process, four individuals in the Office of Internal Audit have received the Certified Risk-Based Internal Auditor designation. And in addition, surveys will be sent out to BCPS executive level management. Once the responses are received, we will review and assess the feedback as we formulate our FY26 work plan. And our next steps include conducting interviews as needed, reviewing and assessing the data received back, and finally determining our work plan format. And this completes our update, and I turn it back over to you, Ms. Booker Dwyer, for any questions, and thank you. Thank you. Um, committee members, are there any questions? And so, Ms. Barr, um, so it is not required that um, executive team members complete the survey or participate in the interview, correct? Ms. Barr? Yeah, yes, I'm sorry, I was, un I was unmuting, I apologize. Um, is it required? No, it's not required uh, by so policy is or by superintendent rule. However, it has been a practice um, within the office and within the organization to reach out and get that feedback. No different than you heard earlier when we uh, worked with the SAF accounting office. So it's important in the development of any work plan to, to get that feedback. I mean, we can develop a work plan with, without the feedback, uh, but we feel that it's important and critical to have that that input and feedback from management. What has been the response rate in the um, in previous iterations uh, of this survey and interview process? Um, I'll have to defer to Ms. Mana because she really spearheaded the um, the risk assessment process, but I believe that we interviewed over a hundred and some individuals and uh, and surveyed as well, but I would defer to her to give more accurate numbers, or it may be something that we would have to to get back to you on um, at a later date, if she doesn't know off the top of yeah. her head. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but I do recall we did do a survey for board members, and I believe four were received, and then we met with all the hundred and however many people it was um, for our process owners and management 
Um, we didn't do it in a survey at that time because it was the first time that we were gathering the information to do a risk assessment for the processes. Therefore, we, we spoke to everybody through a Teams meeting. So four out of 12 board members responded last year or the year before? I believe it was two years ago that we did that. Well, that was two, two three, years yeah. ago. Correct. And then how, um, what was the response for, for the executive staff? We met, with, we met with all of the chiefs and all of the executive directors, either in a group or one-on-one through a Teams meeting. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome. Any other questions on the FY26 work plan updates? Okay, I'll turn it over to Ms. Barr to um, proceed with the FY2025 work plan updates. Uh, thank you once again. As I stated previously, in accordance with policy 8400, we periodically need to adjust our, our current work plan and we'll inform the committee about any adjustments that we need to make. So our FY25 work plan includes a risk-based audit of the early childhood preschool and pre-K program and curriculum related to Maryland Blueprint initiatives. The tentative objective was to determine if BCPS process to expand the pre-K and preschool programs are aligned with the uh, Maryland Blueprint. However, we plan to defer this project to address the request of the BCPS Blueprint Implementation Coordinator. And I will now turn it over to Ms. Manna to provide details related to this adjustment to our work plan. Thank you, Ms. Barr. And as part of our information gathering process for this audit project, we held meetings with applicable early childhood personnel which were um, Ms. Darian, Ms. Boy Ms. Boykin, and Dr. Staley, who monitors and tracks the Maryland Blueprint initiatives. Dr. Staley indicated that BCPS has identified pillar co-leads for each of the five Maryland Blueprint pillars. These individuals are responsible for monitoring Blueprint compliance and um, deliverables through tracking and workbooks and documentation that they maintain. Dr. Staley requested that we assist him with determining a more efficient and streamlined monitoring process for all Maryland Blueprint Pillars. As part of our collaboration with Dr. Staley, um, Ms. Barr and Ms. Smith attended a Blueprint co-lead team meeting yesterday, and we were also provided with additional information to assess and review. So in lieu of the planned um, early childhood audit, we, would like, we are going to continue to work with Dr. Staley and the Pillar co-leads to assess the current processes so that BCPS will meet the Blueprint Pillar requirements. And that concludes our update for the FY25 work plan. And I turn it back to you, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Thank you. Any questions from committee members? And so with the process that you are using, um, how are you incorporating the monitoring that um, and the, mo the monitoring tools and resources that the AIB is using for Blueprint? Um, part of what we're going to do is to contact the AIB as well and see what they their role is and what they are already doing. We don't want to duplicate what they do, but we want to assist Dr. Staley in his request in helping to streamline the process so that their mo whole monitoring is prepared for when AIB or MSDE comes in to look at BCPS. So hearing that there are no other questions from committee members, the I'll move to announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, January 7th, 2025 at 4.30 p.m. This meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Have Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good evening. Night.